Thanks, Joe. That's Joe Apt, one of our new members from the Masters University. Thanks for blessing us with that song, brother. Appreciate you leading us today. If you have your Bibles with you, open up to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. We're doing a verse-by-verse study through this great epistle, or excuse me, through this great gospel, right? The gospel of John. And uh, it has been an invigorating study, and we are in the middle of chapter 2. And uh, last week, we looked at that passage about how Jesus cleansed the temple. In fact, the title of last week's sermon was, It's Time to Clean House. And we talked about how Jesus came into the temple and cleaned it up. And we'll look at that a little bit more today. But basically, today's sermon title is, What Sign Do You Show Us? What sign do you show us? The Jews who were there when Jesus cleansed the temple were a little upset. And so they began to ask Jesus, by what sign do you show us that you can do this? And so here's our text for today, John 2, verses 18 through 22. Here's what the gospel writer John writes. He says, so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then, or excuse me, the Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Father, we bow before you yet again this morning, thanking you for your amazing love Thanking you for filling us with the Spirit. Thank you for saving our hearts from being dead and filled with stone. And I pray that today as we look at this passage that you would enlighten us to the truth of the gospel. That you would allow us to see and hear from the Lord Jesus Christ this message just like he gave it. So that we could apply the principles and live out the truths And be amazed at your glory through our time together in your word today. Do a great work in us through Christ, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, people everywhere are always looking for a sign. People want to hear from God. People want to hear a sign from God. And they say things like, I wish I had a sign from God so that I would know whether he's real or not. People say things like, I wish that I would just really see something from God so I would know uh, what, what, what he wants me to do with my life. Or a skeptic may say, if I'd only been there at the times of Christ when he actually did the miracles, then I could really believe because I could see the miracles with my own eyes. And people always get wrapped up in, in a sign, right? Even Christians say, I wish God would give me a sign so I know exactly which house to buy and which job to take and what he wants me to do in this situation or, or that that situation. People say things like, I wish that I had a sign from heaven so that I would always make the right decision when it seems to be a difficult one. Or we we are desperate for a sign from God that we even are tempted to read into our circumstances. We're tempted sometimes to interpret our dreams. We're tempted sometimes to, to claim that somehow we've received special revelation from God outside of the Bible. And it happens all the time. It happens in our world, it happens in the church at large, and I'm sure it's happened at some point in your life. I mean, at some point, don't look at me so piously, like you would never ask God for a sign. You know you've been there where you've been desperate and your back's up against the wall and you're like, God, I need you to show me what to do, right? But sometimes if we get into really showing from a, uh, asking for a sign, it can be a little bit dangerous. I know that when I was a young man working as a physician's assistant in open heart surgery, I started to feel the call, the desire, the, 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 the change of heart to maybe go from working in medicine to being a pastor, but I wasn't sure if that's what God wanted. I wasn't sure if God wanted me to change my profession, and so I started doing what we all, I started asking for a sign, because of my little bit of a charismatic background, I was like, God, you got to show me. I don't know if it's going to be a cloud in heaven or you're going to have somebody come up. I don't know what's going to go on. And so I kept waiting to hear from God and I wasn't hearing anything. So I decided to get a little more specific. And so I asked God to show me a sign in this way. I said, God, if you want me to be a pastor, I pray that you would have Billy Graham call me on the phone. I mean, go big or go home, right? If you're going to get a sign, let's do this. So I'm like, I need Billy to call me on the phone and to tell me that you told him that I'm supposed to be a pastor. 
So I prayed that prayer, and I sat by my phone for a day, for a week, and guess what happened? Billy never called. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I was supposed to be here or not this morning, but Billy, <laughs> he, never, he never called me. And it wasn't until I had a friend really challenge me because he knew I was struggling with this decision. He's like, well, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm praying about it. You know, and I've asked for to see a sign from God. I'm just not sure what I'm supposed to do. And he's like, you know, he's challenging me in this area. And so I, I started checking out various seminaries and I, I kind of came across the Master Seminary website. So I, I clicked on it to do a little research. And there was an article that said, how do you know if you're called in the ministry? I'm like, maybe that's a sign, you know. So, so I download this article and start reading it, and it just simply took me back to the scripture, and it says basically there's got to be these three things in your life. Number one, you need to have a desire. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, that's to be a pastor, to find work he desires to do. And so the author of the article just made it simple. You need to have a desire to do this. Number two, you've got to have a godly character. And the passage goes on to give the qualifications for elders in the church. They've got to be a one-woman man, above reproach, not given over to the love of money, not pugnacious, you know, be hospitable. And so I, I felt like by the grace of God, I was building godly character. And then the third qualification in that passage is you've got to be able to teach. If you don't have the gift of teaching or at least some raw gift that God seems to have placed in a young man or an older man, then you really don't need to think about being involved in pastoral ministry. And it was really from the objective teaching of Scripture that was explained to me that kind of helped me come along, not to like seeing a sign in the sky or having somebody call me on the phone. It was just the Word of God. It was the work of God through His Word that helped me to see that, that it was time for me to, to finish up my job and to move out and go to the Master's Seminary. And you know that you've all, we've all been there, right? We've all tried to make decisions, and we look to Scripture, and you say, well, Adam, I, I'm glad you had a chapter and verse, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. I don't have one. I don't have a chapter and verse like that about should I be a fireman or a teacher. Nowhere in the Bible to say the qualifications of a fireman, you know, the qualifications of a teacher. So what do you say about that? You know, I would say, well, don't ask for a sign because we're about to see in this text that really asking for a sign is not evidence of faith. It's evidence of doubt. Asking for a sign from God is not something that's commended in the Bible. It's something that's condemned in the Bible. And that's exactly what this text is teaching us, that these Pharisees that are asking for a sign weren't really going about it in the right way. Whether it be the case of Gideon in Judges 6, or the case of Hezekiah in Isaiah 38, or the case of the Pharisees, every time, just about in the Bible, that somebody's kind of demanding a sign from God, it usually doesn't go so well with them. Or, God could be gracious, like he was with Gideon, and in his kindness, choose to kind of give him that sign he asked for, but it's not the normal way, and it's really not something we're encouraged to do throughout Scripture. And so what we're going to do this morning is see exactly how Jesus answers this question, what sign do you show me? And so in case you're tempted to ask that same question, God, show me a sign, just look at how Jesus answers this question to these Jews in this text as we look at it. And I've basically broken down today's message into five headings. So if you are taking notes, this first heading to see how Jesus answers the question, show me a sign, is this. Number one, we're going to look at the demanding question. The demanding question here, verse 18 again. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And can I say your first blank here? In one sense, this is a reasonable question. Like in one sense, it makes a little bit of sense from a human level that, that, that you know, keep in mind, Jesus had just cleaned the temple. He, he had just uh, made a whip of cords and drove all the people out of the temple. He had just turned over the tables of the money changers. He had just poured out their coins onto the ground. I mean, he had just really gotten in their face. And so in, in one sense, it's like, it's not that unusual or odd that these people would ask, what, 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 what is it that, that the authority, what sign do you have that you could do this? I mean, he had accused the Jews of turning their father's house into a den of thieves. They had, they had uh, turned the temple into a thoroughfare. They had turned that which should have been consecrated to God to a place of commerce. It was more important for them to, to make a buck than to be a witness in the world. They had become more interested in making money than they were in worshiping the living God. And so Jesus came and he cleaned house. 
And we talked last week about maybe that's what we need in our church. Maybe that's what you need in your heart is you are the temple of God, 1 Corinthians 3 says. Do you not know that you're the temple of God? Maybe we need Jesus to come in and do a little inventory in our own hearts and in our own church to see whether or not he should come turn this house back into a house of prayer for all nations. Jesus was consumed with zeal, with passion for the holiness of God. And so in one sense, I would say it is appropriate that they would say, who are you? In essence, they're saying, Jesus, who do you think you are to come in here and do that in this house? What authority do you have? I mean, we don't really know you. You don't have the credential. We've not seen you before. Remember, Jesus is just kicking off his ministry. I believe that this episode took place in the first part of his ministry. He's not that well known. And so who is this guy? Now, I'd like to just point out a couple observations to you. I think that if Jesus would have been a crazy man like a drunk or someone who is insane, who would have come in and mumbled and done all this crazy stuff, I don't think he would have garnered that much attention. I think that basically the Jewish leaders would have assigned two broad-chested men to walk up to Jesus and just take him by the arm and escort him out of the temple. I mean, it's not like Jesus had them outnumbered. Jesus was outnumbered. He's one man. He's just one man. They could have easily just snuffed this out like a scene today in a public area would just be two policemen would go in and just drag this person, like they're dragging them off the planes, right? I heard it happen again. In fact, I was talking to somebody. You know all these headlines you see on the news, like they drug somebody off the plane? I was just talking to somebody this week. I can't remember who it was. And they were like, man, I was on a plane. And that plane got, you know, we landed uh, between these cities and they had to take this lady off the plane who was just causing a fit. You know, it's like, it can be done, right? They could have easily taken Jesus and dragged him out of the temple and that would have been the end of it. So why didn't they? Why didn't they? Why did they ask him this question Then, in one sense gave him a larger opportunity to really say what he wanted to say about the actions he had just done? And I, I think, the Bible doesn't say this, but I would suggest to you, I think they were convicted. I think that in their own hearts and in their own conscience, they knew they had been robbing God. They knew that the words of Christ was right. They knew that there was something about him and something about the way that he moved around the temple with familiarity, that he was right in what he said, and they stood condemned. And yet they wanted to hide it. They wanted to work around it. They wanted to act all righteous. Well, who, who do you think you are? What sign can you show us? We're, in, we're the authorities of this temple. We're the ones in charge, not you. Who do you think you are? And so they turn it into this conversation, trying to approach it from an intellectual route. They were thinking that, that, that they could beat Jesus by humiliating him through this argument. They were really rationalizing in their own mind, trying to explain away Jesus' actions. And so in one sense, I'm saying it's reasonable that they would question him. But in another sense, your next blank says that there is doubting unbelief here. There's, there's no, it's, there's, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. They don't really want a good answer from Christ. They're not really looking for an answer. It's almost as if it's a rhetorical question where they're rebuking him for doing what he's doing, saying, you don't have any authority. We do. And so they have doubting unbelief. And this happens throughout the New Testament. When Jesus is in various venues doing various things in his ministry, they oftentimes will just stop him and demand from him a sign. It's not like the only time it happens. In fact, you can jot down some of these cross-references if you want. Matthew 16, verse 1, and the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Mark chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Luke 11, 15 and 16, but some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebul and the the prince of demons, while others to test him kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. Luke 23, verse 8 says this, When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had, a long, he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. John chapter 6, verse 30. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? And one last one in 1 Corinthians 1, 22 says, For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. And so my point would simply be that these people who are seeking a sign are not coming with a humble, teachable heart. 
Right? They're not coming in to say, oh, great teacher, help us understand what, where we've gone wrong. Right? They're more accusing him and confronting him. And more than that, they're commanding him to do another miracle, another sign at their beckoning call. They wanted proof in their time and in their way. Well, listen to me this morning. Jesus is not a genie. You don't have three wishes and you can wish for whatever you want, right? Jesus is not a hired magician. He's not a David Copperfield entertainer. He does what he does, when he wants, and how he wants. Jesus is God. He will reveal himself however he wants, to who he wants, in the way that he chooses to do it. And he takes orders from nobody, except maybe his Father in heaven. And it's that these people... We're trying to out-strong arm Jesus. And Jesus taught us in a situation like this, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verse 6, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So in other words, Jesus teaches that when you're in context like this, an outright confrontation, maybe that's not the best place to give the sign of the gospel. Maybe that's not the best time to do whatever people are saying. Maybe that's just the time to walk away and say, you know what? We'll talk about this later. Right now, I don't think this is the time or the place. And that's what Jesus discerned was going on. And he said, basically, at this point, don't don't throw your pearls to the swine because all they're going to do is trample you underfoot and attack you anyway. So we have to have some discernment. And maybe another observation would be here. Consider what Jesus says in your next blank about this generation being an evil and adulterous generation, right? That's who seeks for a sign, I was warning you, don't, don't be seeking for a sign, you know, because nowhere in the Bible are we encouraged to actually do that. In fact, in all these contexts, it's like, whoa, 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 time out. An evil and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. You've got to look at it with your own eyes. Look at Matthew 12, where it says that, because there's, there's a couple more things in that cross-reference. Matthew 12, verses 38 through 41. This is when some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered him, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Now, it sounds so humble, right? Like, hey, Jesus, can you just show us something? But remember, Jesus knew what was within a man. And in these contexts, he's saying, this is not actually what they're doing. And so in verse 39, Matthew 12, 39, but he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now listen to what he's saying. He's like, hey, I'm not going to give you a sign. In other words, I'm not going to do just another miracle to appease your curiosity. I'm not doing that. If you want a sign, it's already in the Bible. If you want a sign... Look at your Old Testament. If you want a sign, it's in the sign of Jonah. Do you remember Jonah? You remember what he did? Verse 40, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus is like, you, you want a sign? Do you remember, you remember the story of Jonah? Jonah was a prophet. He was supposed to be sent by God to Nineveh, a pagan city, to preach repentance. He got scared, didn't want to go to Nineveh, got on the ship, headed to Tarshish. The great storm came. He was thrown into the water. A great fish swallowed him up. And for three days and three nights, Jonah was in the belly of that great fish. And it was at that point where Jonah had a, kind of a come to Jesus meeting, right? Where he repented and he was spit out and he went and preached repentance to the Ninevites. Now, don't get too distracted in the three days and three nights. I know sometimes for a young Bible student, you'll be like, well, Jesus is supposed to be in the grave three days and three nights, but he was crucified on Friday night and then there's Saturday night and then he was raised Sunday morning. So how does that work? So just real quick, in the Jewish keeping of times, any part of a 24-hour segment would include a day and night concept. So if he's taken into custody Friday evening, then part of the day Friday is counts. So count that as Friday and Friday night. Then he's, then he, then he's crucified, I mean, if he's, uh, excuse me, if he's crucified on Friday, right, then count that as the day and the night of Friday. Then he's in the grave Saturday, day and night Saturday. He's raised on Sunday morning, but it still counts as a day and a night. Does that make sense? So don't think if you're trying to do the math, well, maybe, you know, just don't worry about it, right? And, and I'm just saying that's the way the Jewish people kept time. That's what they would have done. It would have been a common understanding 
that just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, Jesus, three days and three nights, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And so just as that happened to Jonah, he's saying that's what's going to happen to Christ. And something greater than Jonah's here. If Jonah, after that experience, went out to Nineveh, preached repentance, and the king tore his garments and the whole city repented of these people you would think would never come to the knowledge of God. That's why Jonah didn't want to go there. He hated them. They were horrible. The atrocities that they committed were unbelievable. And Jonah was prejudiced against them. And yet he went to them. He preached about repentance and belief in Yahweh. And they repented and believed. And then Jesus says, that generation, that wicked generation, that generation of Gentile pagans, they would rise up and condemn you guys. That's what he's saying to the Jews. They would condemn you. At least they repented and came to, to the true knowledge of God. And yet you guys, uh, you guys are demanding for, for another sign. He, he's saying, you don't need a sign, you need a savior. You don't need a miracle, you need a master. You don't need physical healing, you need spiritual healing. You don't need to be wild on earth, you need to be transplanted into heaven. You don't need to be entertained, you need to be transformed. He's telling them, this is what needs to happen in your life if you want to walk with God. You need to be transformed, and it all comes through this sign. And so we see the second question, if we, if we look at the second statement, rather, the second heading, number two, is the veiled answer. Verse 19, so again, they demand a sign from Christ, and in verse 19, he answers them, uh, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Your next blank says this, false witnesses accused Jesus of saying he would destroy the temple. Okay? I say Jesus' answer is veiled in the sense that it is definitely a cryptic answer that his adversaries don't fully understand. This is the type of answer from Christ that needs to be pondered to be understood correctly because it can lead to gross misinterpretation if you're not following what Jesus is saying, which is exactly why those cross-references next to that point are at the end of Jesus' life when he is taken into custody the night before he was crucified. And in Mark 14, 58, listen to what these false witnesses accuse Jesus of saying. We heard him say... I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And in three days, I will build another not made with hands. While Jesus was hanging on the cross, yet further skeptics said in Mark 15, 29, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. But what are are they missing? Both times they accused Jesus of saying that he would destroy the temple. But notice what Jesus said. Again, look at verse 19. He doesn't say, I will destroy the temple. He just simply says, destroy this temple. And in the original language, that is your next blank, Jesus is actually saying, you destroy this temple. In the original, it's in the second person plural. So that verb that is offered has an understood subject that tells us who's saying what. And basically, it's a second person plural verb, which is simply saying, Jesus is actually saying, he's not saying, I will destroy the temple. He's saying, you're going to destroy the temple. He's saying that you will destroy it. Not not only is he saying you will destroy it, this verb is an imperative. It is a command. In one sense, he's actually commanding them to crucify him. That's what he's doing. He's saying, you destroy this temple, and I'll build it back in three days. He's commanding his own crucifixion. You say, Adam, I don't think Jesus would command that. All right. Look at John 13, 27. John 13, 27, at the Last Supper, then after they had taken, he had taken the morsel, speaking of Judas Iscariot, Satan entered him, and Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, what? Do quickly. It's a command. Jesus looks at Judas Iscariot and says, hey, I know what you're about to do. Do it quickly. In a sense, he's commanding the destruction of, of his body. He's demanding the crucifixion. He's calling for his own death. And yet these Jews, back to John 2, are just completely confused about it. Right? They, they don't know what he's talking about. They don't understand what he's saying. They don't even understand maybe there's further irony here. In one sense, your next blank says this, if anyone destroys Christ's body, he's talking of his spiritual temple, And we get that from verse 21, right? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. 
just to make sure you're staying with what Christ meant. So if anyone destroys Christ's body, that would be his spiritual temple, then he also destroys the structure in Jerusalem. So Adam, you lost me on that one. Here's what I'm saying. If you crucify Christ, which needed to be done, which Jesus commanded to be done, then the gospel fulfills itself and you no longer need the temple as a major emphasis of your relationship with God. If you crucify Christ, he's the mediator by which man meets with God. Christ is the holy of holies. If you crucify Christ, the temple is obsolete. If the temple is obsolete, then it has no more use. But since the Jews didn't see Jesus as the Christ, they continued temple sacrifices in disobedience And so God judged them by having the temple destroyed in 70 AD. The temple was destroyed in 586 BC by the Babylonians because the Jews were unfaithful to God. The temple is now destroyed in 70 AD for the exact same reason. The Jewish people are disobedient to God. They're not repentant. They don't see Christ as the Savior. And so in one sense, it's a little ironic, isn't it, that he's saying, you destroy the temple. He could be saying, in a sense, hey, you're going to crucify me, but you're also destroying your own temple. Because you're not looking to me, you're not believing in me, and that's why Jesus does outright prophesy the destruction of the physical temple in that cross-reference Mark 13, 1 and 2, as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings, and Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So in that passage, he is talking about the destruction of the literal temple, the physical temple in Jerusalem. It would be destroyed. And so the the idea here is that Jesus is trying to teach them, take your focus off that which is temporal, off that which is physical, and look to me. Look to me. If if, if, If you destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. And yet they don't get that. And so Jesus is speaking, again, in this veiled way where they don't quite get it, which is one more comment about that, your next blank. Like the parables, this enigmatic statement judiciously concealed the truth from hostile unbelievers. That's a mouthful. Well, just look at it with me. This, the, the, just like the parables, this is what Jesus did with the parables. This, this statement with hidden meaning judges those who are hostile unbelievers by concealing the truth from them. This is how Jesus worked. In fact, turn with me to Matthew 13, and you'll see what I'm talking about, spelled out with a little bit more verbiage. Matthew 13, right between the point of telling the parable of the soils, what some people call the parable of the sower, where there were three different soils, and that the seed that was sown didn't take root there or bear fruit there. And then you have the three soils of 30, 60, 100. Remember the parable, right? Right in the middle of that, but after he told it, before he explained it, this is where we are, Matthew 13, 10, then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? So the disciples are a little curious. They're like, well, why... Jesus, why, why are you telling stories? Like, this is like a riddle. Why are you doing this? Verse 11, and he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Key word, given. To you it's been given. Not something you earn. It's not something you figure out. It's not something that intellect can do. You've got to be given the understanding. You can't get the interpretation unless God gives you the interpretation because you're not able to figure it out on your own. It's got to be a sovereign work of God to reveal his truth to you. So Jesus specifically teaches that understanding has not been given to everyone universally. Understanding, which comes from the Spirit of God, enlightening the mind and transforming the heart, Thus, producing repentance and faith is a prerequisite to understanding what Jesus is saying. In other words, if you're not saved, you don't understand what Jesus meant. If you are saved, you understand what he meant. If you're not saved, you don't understand what he meant. The unbelieving Jews didn't understand Jesus. The disciples got it as they came to faith, which is why he continues in Matthew 13, verse 12, for the one who has more will be given, and he will have an abundance. He's saying to the Christian who has been given the precious gift of knowledge of the gospel, he's going to get more. You're going to keep reading the Bible and keep understanding the Bible and grow in your understanding because the Holy Spirit is going to enlighten every believer through the Bible that you get more and more and more. You'll never get tired of this book. 
You'll never get weary of spiritual truth. You'll never want to just say, hey, I read through the Bible, I'm going to do something else. You always want more. To him it is given, more is coming. But then notice what he says, halfway through verse 12. But for the one who has not, the one who doesn't believe, the one who doesn't have faith, the one who doesn't understand, for the one who has not, not even what he has, excuse me, even what he has will be taken away. What little understanding the unbeliever has is going to be taken away. This is why, gives the answer here, verse 13, this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their eyes they can barely, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. You say, Adam, what is he saying? He's simply saying that if people could see and understand on their own, then faith would not be faith. You see that? If they were able to just approach it and analyze it like you would a poem or some other work of literature, and you were able just to approach it and get it and understand it and apply it without the Spirit of God, then you don't need the Spirit of God. Everybody could be saved just by reading the Bible, and yet they're not. Everybody could be saved because there's a lot of people who saw Jesus do the miracles that he did, and they did not come to Christ. Why? Because it's more than human intellect. It's more than personal observation. It is more than thinking what you want to think about what you've seen. You must be given faith by Almighty God. You and I are dead until God makes us alive. It's called sovereign grace. You can't save yourself. You bring nothing. You say, well, Adam, I'm trying to figure it out. Well, I can appreciate that. But ask God. It's not about you trying to figure it out with human ingenuity. It's about begging God to save your soul. Because until you're saved, you'll never understand the Bible. You'll never understand God's teaching. You'll never get it. Look, you could be here your whole life and study the Scriptures from top to, to bottom, but until you just stop and say, God, I can't, you can. God, I'm nothing. You're everything. God, I can't do this. I need a touch from you. God, I need you to change my heart and my life based on the gospel. You can never get it. And in some ways, that sounds like a condemning message because you're like, so you're saying it's not up to us? That's what I'm saying. It's not up to you. It's the grace of God. And you say, well, that's not fair. No, it's not fair that he saved you. It's not fair that he opened your heart to the gospel. And yet he did because he's loving and he's kind And he's benevolent and he draws whom he wants into a relationship with him through his gospel. And this is the very reason why some get it and some don't. And so if you're here today and you've never really understood the gospel and you've never really understood why everyone else is excited about Christ and if you're just kind of going along for the ride, you need to stop right now and say, you know what, I need God. You say, well, what do I do? Just repent, turn from your sin Turn to Christ, see his love for you. Meditate on the death of Christ for your sin. See his beauty. And as you contemplate the beauty of Christ in the gospel, beg him to open your eyes to the gospel. For no one who comes in that heart and that mindset will he ever cast out. And yet at the same time, he says, the Father who sent me must draw him. We must be drawn by the Father. And so let me move on. You'll see a little bit more of this in our next heading. Number three, the confused response. Verse 20, the confused response. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? Now the Jews knew, right, how long it had taken to build the temple. It was Herod the Great who had ordered the building of this temple to greatly enhance the temple that had been rebuilt by Zerubbabel after the exile. And the temple had never reached the same state of glory as the first temple of Solomon. So historians believe that the work of Herod's temple, commanded by King Herod the Great, began at 20 
to 19 BC. And if this took them 46 years to get to this point, then we're in year 27 or 28 AD. And according to Josephus, they were still putting the final touches on the temple and didn't finish it completely until around 63 AD, which was seven years before it was destroyed by the Romans. And so that's kind of what they're saying. They're like, look, it took us 46 years to get here and we're still working on it. You're going to destroy it and and, and it's going to be destroyed and then you're going to build it up in three days? I mean, the irony here is that First of all, Jesus isn't talking about the temple. He's talking about his body, and they didn't get it. The second thought could be, you think three days is too short for Jesus to rebuild a temple? Like, he could do it in one second. He could just be like, temple, bam, it's all there. It's not like he needed three days. I mean, so they don't get the fact that he's God. He is creator God. He holds the heavens and the earth in his hands. He can do whatever he wants. So confusion like this is really apparent In various places in the Gospel of John, let me just point you to three significant times where people are confused about the same thing, understanding salvation, and they get confused by Jesus' choice of teaching style. How about this one, your next blank, confusion about what it means to be born again. We'll look at this passage in just a few weeks, but it's the story of Nicodemus who had no ability until God made it known to him what he meant when he said, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And so Nicodemus replies, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So in other words, Jesus' teaching makes no sense to the natural mind. How in the world can somebody be born again? And yet Jesus is talking about regeneration, spiritual life. It's got to happen through repentance and faith in Christ. There's confusion about Jesus uh, talking about being the bread of life. Your next blank. In John 6, 41, in one of the feasts, he comes in and he starts to teach about how I am the bread of heaven, how he, he came as the bread of heaven, and no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. And, and, and he talks about how Moses gave you the manna in the, in the wilderness, but I'm the bread of life, he says, in John 6, 48. And, and they didn't understand that. They were so confused, and they, they didn't understand, and they said, how can we eat his flesh? We don't get this. So this is normal teaching of Jesus to teach something that to the Christian, he's like, I get it. That makes total sense. It's because you've been saved by the grace of God. He gives you understanding. It's called the Holy Spirit that enlightens our mind to the Scripture. Another time of confusion would have been confusion about Jesus being the resurrection and the life. John 11, the story of Lazarus dying. And uh, Jesus says, hey, he's going to live again. And Martha says, well, I know he'll be, you know, live again at the resurrection. And Jesus said, no, you don't understand. I am the resurrection in the life. I'm not talking about on that last day. I'm talking about today. I'm going to raise your brother from the grave. And so there's these common areas in the New Testament where what Jesus is teaching seems to be confusing, and yet it's really not confusing if God opens our heart and our mind to the glory of God. And so many of us get confused when we read the Bible and we try to discern what God is up to, what he's saying on our own human ability, which is why we like to encourage inductive Bible study and what we call expository preaching, the whole idea of really studying the passage, understanding the context, looking a little bit, if you're able, at the original language when needed uh, to do cross-referencing and to really let the Bible speak in the way it was written through the power of the Holy Spirit for the believer. And that's why a bunch of liberals could take the Bible, who are unbelievers, and start to scoff and rip it up into shreds, saying, well, this couldn't be true, and that couldn't be true, because that doesn't make any sense. And it's like, you're using your brain you got to start using the transformed heart of the living God. It's called faith, and it's only given by God. You can't come as a skeptic. You have to come as a repentant, begging sinner. And as he saves you by grace, then you're able to see the gospel, and you're able to move forward, and you're able to see and discern what God would have you do based on Scripture. It's not based on emotion. It's not based on your story to tell. It's not based on your experience. It's not based on what you think you heard from God. Because if all that happens outside of this book, outside of God's word, then you're living in a very precarious situation to where you may not be walking uh, in, in, in step with the Spirit of God, which leads us through the Word of God. We need to be students of the Word. At the same time, I would say, let's, be, let's, let's find where Jesus is working and let's go join Him there. Like, let's don't be so analytical. We're like, well, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to witness to that person or not because I don't see a verse about witnessing to that guy over there. It's, like, it's called the Great Commission. 
Go and take the gospel to all nations. Well, I'm not sure if I should seek forgiveness for my wife or not. She was really mean to me. It's called forgive. Right? I mean, it's like we pray about these silly things as if, well, I'm not sure if I can you know, buy that new Corvette you know, or not. I can't afford it and give faithfully to the Lord. Maybe you can, and that's fine. I'll borrow it you know, for a weekend or something. I'll, I like people like that, you know, but it's like I can't do that. So instead of just like praying for a sign, we're saying look to the word, live a redemptive life, and bring the gospel to bear on every situation you're in. And this really gets us to our fourth heading this morning on verse 21, the greatest sign ever given. And we've already discussed this, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. So if you haven't gotten it by now, let me state it clearly. Jesus was not going to give any other sign as the ultimate proof of his divinity, except the sign of the crucifixion and the resurrection. You starting to see that? He's like, there's no greater sign. It's not about me doing these random miracles, and no miracle that he did was ever random, but it's not about doing that. It's about everything I do is to point you to the gospel. Because if you don't see the gospel, and if you're not transformed by the gospel, you don't have faith, you don't have life, you don't have God-glorifying purpose without salvation. And so here he gives, uh, the next blank says, four clear pictures of the crucifixion and resurrection. We see this is the whole point of the Bible when he is doing, uh, doing different things that could be considered as a sign. It's always pointing to the gospel. John 1, 29, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 2, 19, that's this text, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. John 3, 14, and Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Another sign of the gospel. John 4, excuse me, John 12, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit, another sign that points to the gospel. What I'm trying to say is simply that these all point to the ultimate sign, which is not Jesus doing yet something else. Maybe we could say it this way, your next blank. If there was a sign greater than this sign, then this wouldn't be the greatest sign. Follow what I'm saying? If if Jesus could have said, well, I'll do this and this will prove that I'm really God then whatever he did as that ultimate example now becomes the supreme sign in the universe. And the supreme sign is always going to be the cross. It's always the crucifixion. It's not like he has to, you know, turn that chair from blue to red and then you'll believe the gospel. No, it doesn't work like that. That sign's not better than the gospel sign. The gospel sign, the sign of Jonah, of death and life through the gospel, which Jonah foreshadows in the belly of the great fish, is the greatest sign that could ever be given to change somebody and cause them to believe. And yet you and I minimize the sign of the gospel by, in your witnessing conversations, you try to come up with another way, another you know, apologetic argument, another story that somehow affirms that the gospel is true. No, the gospel is what changes people's lives. How many times have you and I been in a conversation where you try to kind of give the gospel and the person, you know, confesses their doubts and then you try to change course and say, well, maybe I'll get them this way. What way? How are you going to get to them? You're going to really just abandon the gospel because they seem to doubt it and say, oh, if I give them this, then they'll come. Now, I'm not saying don't, don't be wise in how you work through issues like maybe even creation, evolution, and abortion, and whatever. We can get all these issues, but those things in and of themselves won't save anybody. They need to be saved by the gospel, and, and yet we come up with these you know, apologetic arguments, the cosmo, uh, cosmological argument, the idea that, that, that there's a world that exists, that so there must be a God, the te- teleological argument, uh, the, the idea that there's order in the universe and there must be a God, the anthropological argument, the idea that, that man's constitution can be traced back to the fact that there is a God, the ontological argument, the idea that God exists because humans can conceive of his existence, therefore he exists. Those are, those are all fall short to save a lost sinner. What you need is the gospel of Jesus Christ. What you need is the resurrection. What you need is when people say, well, I don't believe in the resurrection, so there. Then, then, then you just keep coming at them and just say, well, look, I don't believe in your authority, which is your own human logic, so there. You know, it's like, I mean, you can't just let them take it out. I mean, people all the time, you're witnessing to somebody, well, I don't believe the Bible. 
And then as a Christian, we're like, okay, well, uh, you know, and we try to somehow get them to the gospel without the Bible. Just like, I'm sorry, I do believe the Bible. We can't have an intelligent conversation if we're not bringing our sources of, of authority into this conversation. For you, again, it's your own mind and the media and entertainment and our culture, right? For me, it's the Word of God. So let's talk. And let's see which worldview really saves the heart of a man. Because I'll take my Bible against any human being any day, no matter how popular they are, and I'll just continue to reason with them, Lord willing, through Scripture and getting to the gospel about what saves a person. I mean, isn't this Paul's argument about the, the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15? The whole chapter is focused just on that. If Christ is proclaimed and raised from the dead... How come some of you say he's not raised from the dead? And if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching would be in vain. And if Christ had not been raised, then our faith is futile. And, and, and it, we're still in our sins. If, Christ, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people to be pitied. I mean, he's saying, let's stop playing games. It's all about the gospel. Either you get this sign or you don't get it. I'm not going to start doing other signs to somehow affirm the most important historical event of the universe, the crucifixion and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this leads to our last point here. Number five is the redemptive memory. The, Jew, the, uh, the disciples finally got it fully, if they don't have it already, when therefore he was raised from the dead. So after the crucifixion and resurrection, when the disciples fully moved into a like, oh, okay, now we get it. The, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word Jesus has spoken. Don't you just love that? He said they believed the what? The scripture. What scripture? All the scriptures that Jesus used in his whole earthly ministry to point to the fact that he was the Messiah. All the scriptures that would have been contained in the canon of the Old Testament, which was quoted by Christ regularly when he said, it is written. So they're saying all of the scripture of the Old Testament, plus everything Jesus has said, which is on par with scripture as divine revelation, offers us, the, the, the truth of pointing to your next blank because of the cross and the empty tomb. Because of, of all of this scripture, all of this truth, now we understand the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And through that, we don't need a temple. This whole argument about would the temple be destroyed, and who cares? We don't need the temple. We got Jesus. We have Christ he is the temple of God, and in us, we become the temple of God. And so all these different arguments that Jesus even foreshadows this in John 4, 21, in the discussion with the woman from the well at Samaria, when she's like, which mountain should we worship, this mountain or this mountain? Jesus said, do you remember what he said to her? He didn't say, oh, it's the, it's the mountain in Jerusalem. That's not what he said. Which you would have thought he would say, hey, there's just one temple, one place, everything else is wrong, you've got to come to this temple. That's how I would have answered the question. And said, Jesus says, that doesn't matter anymore. It's not about which temple you worship at. He says, it matters neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. That's what he's saying. The hour is coming just, just, just right here to where now you just worship Christ alone. You have access to the Father through the Son. It's because of the cross that, that this all happens. And it's kind of like the disciples in verse 22. They, they get that. They get that. And then your next blank says, uh, God used scripture and the words of Christ as the divine revelation to bring believers into newness of life. So what does he use? The scripture. That's what he used in the disciples' hearts. And the words of Christ, the story of Jesus, the, the, the crucifixion and resurrection. That's what brings uh, salvation and change into a person's heart. To me, it's kind of like reminding me of you know, all those times you read something in the Bible and you just kind of ponder on it and you don't really get it. And you just kind of keep thinking about it and praying about it and reading in its context. You know, something like, I desire obedience over sacrifice. Something like, you can't serve both God and money. Something like, if you want to save your life, you must be willing to lose it. You know, it's kind of like we read all these statements in the Bible, but one day it just really lights up. And you're just like, ah, oh, that's what Jesus meant when he said that. And that applies to this situation in my life right now. And so I don't need to ask for a sign. I just need to look back to the gospel. I need to look to Christ. I need to look to his word. I need to study it out. I need to be sensitive to the spirit. I need to know that the spirit of God leads me through the word of God. And I need to stop doubting God. I need to live a life of faith. And so we can end maybe this message by asking these three take-home questions. Number one, have you ever asked God to show you a sign? You know you have. 
At some point, we probably all have. And I would, part of me would be like, that's okay, you're learning, we're learning, we're growing. But I think from this sermon on, I don't think that you should be like, yeah, I'm asking for a sign, waiting for a sign. Like, watch out, it's an evil and an adulterous uh, generation who asks for a sign from God. Instead of asking for a sign, look at the gospel, which affirms everything that's in the Bible, read it, study it, and live it out by the grace of God. Number two, have you ever wondered why Jesus revealed himself to some, but not to others? I have. I read through stuff like this, and I'm like, man, why didn't he just tell everybody? And it's like, that's not his plan. He's God. I'm not. He reveals himself in the way he chooses. As he, I don't have the right to say, show them a sign. I, I don't have that right. God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for showing me the gospel. Would you do that work in my friend, in my spouse, in my child, in my aunt, my uncle, my coworker? God, would you reveal yourself to them because they'll never get it unless you save them by your grace. Number three, have you ever felt like you needed more truth than the resurrection? You ever felt like in one of those conversations the resurrection wasn't good enough and you needed to go somewhere else? Don't do it. Jesus never did. He never did. He always came back to say, you want a sign? I'm going to show you the gospel. You want a sign? I'm going to show you about the crucifixion and resurrection. I'm going to show you from the Old Testament. I'm going to show you through all my teaching. I'm going to show it by living it out. And then when I'm raised from the dead, I'm going to keep telling you about it and keep showing you the gospel over and over. Show us a sign, God. He has. It's the sign of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to look a little bit more deeper into this text, maybe a familiar text for many of us. And yet for some of us in this room, God, we still haven't seen this sign clearly. And that's not our fault in some ways, Lord, because we're unable. But we ask you by faith that at this service, at this time, you would open the hearts of those that you would save by your own glory, in your own power, in your own ability to bring people from death to life. And so, God, whether there be children in this service or teenagers or college students or young adults or older adults, God, we pray that you would have your way in us. God, you have authority to clean this temple. You have authority to do what you do by the power of the gospel. And you have the power, God, to change hearts and to change minds. So forgive us, Lord, for being distracted. Forgive us for sometimes in our own way demanding you for extra signs and evidence of you being at work. Help us to believe by faith in the work of the gospel and the work of grace and the work of all the scripture and to be sanctified not only by the power of God but by helping us obey you as we trust you and lean into that sovereign act of grace in our sanctification kind of way God we need your help it's all of you and yet you demand us to live a life that's holy and so in one sense we can never do it God but in another sense we want to be obedient we want to live a life of joy and sacrifice to you we want to keep coming back again and again and again to the sign of Jonah. For those who are unbelievers, it condemns them to an eternity without you. But for those who believe, it's a sign of beauty, a sign of the gospel, a sign of repentance, a sign of resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in the hearts of your people. So God, do a special work of grace on this day in each heart, in this room. And that based on this message and the clarity of the, the gospel truths that we've looked at, God, may we love more this week. May we sacrifice more this week. May we be more hospitable this week. May we be quicker to run to forgiveness this week. May we bless others this week. May we encourage those that we come in contact this week. May we have a greater boldness in our hearts to be evangelistic this week. Oh God, we thank you for the sign that Jesus gave. We thank you for Christ himself. We thank you for his death, his sacrifice, our substitute. So we sing this song to you, God, in light of these, these truths. We cry out to you with hearts that are full this morning to declare your glory in all the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>